The second coming is different from the rapture. In the rapture, He comes before judgment. In the second coming, He returns with judgment. The rapture is before the tribulation period. The second coming is at the end of the tribulation period. In the rapture, He comes for His people. In the second coming, He returns with His people. In the rapture, He comes as a thief in the night. In the second coming, every eye will see. The second coming of Jesus is mentioned so many times in Scripture. It's mentioned over 18 times in the Old Testament and 300 times in the New Testament. Statistically, one verse out of every 25 mentions the Lord's return. It's referred to in 27 Old Testament books and 23 New Testament books. For every prophecy about the first coming of Christ, there are eight prophecies about His second coming. Isn't that interesting? So it's a message that's repeated over and over in the Bible. Something we should be paying attention to. Something that, that should affect the way that we live. And I think your very reaction to this idea that Christ could come back is a spiritual barometer as to where you are at. If your heart leaps and you're filled with joy and you're saying, man, I hope it's soon, that's a good thing. If there's a sense of dread and fear, that's a bad thing. I like how John responds in the book of Revelation. Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. And John says, amen, come Lord Jesus. That's something every believer should say. Amen, come Lord Jesus. <laughs> Let's say that together right now, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now say it like you mean it. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's right. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is something we read about so many times. In fact, I would say the incarnation without the coronation would be like the east without the west. The incarnation, the birth of Christ. The coronation, the second coming of Christ are so important, they're bookends given to us in Scripture. In one of the most well-known statements in Matthew 24, Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon will not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Not great glory, great glory. Though I do plan on coming back with Jesus, and if that sounds insane, hold on, I'll tell you why. Because it's not just gonna be me, it's gonna be you too. We play a part in the big picture of what is yet to come. All right, so what are we gonna do after the rapture and before the second coming? I'm glad you asked. Let's read about it. Revelation 19, verse seven. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And it was granted to her to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, write this, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true saints of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said, see that you do not do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brothers who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So an angel is revealing this to the apostle John. He's so blown away. He wants to worship the angel. The angel is saying, hey, don't do that. Uh, worship God only. But then this important statement, underline it in your Bible. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. We'll come back to that. The righteous linen that is mentioned here speaks of the righteous acts of the saints. Verse eight, what does this mean? First of all, let me say that when you become a Christian, you become a righteous person. I stand before you today as a righteous man. You might say, Greg, I've seen you drive. I don't think you're righteous. 
I didn't say I always behave in a righteous way, but I am technically and positionally a righteous person. I am a holy person. I am a saint. But you are too. All of us are. But then there are the, when we live that out. So good works don't save me, but if I'm really saved, there will be good works. There will be results. So what's interesting here is it says this clothing we are wearing are the righteous acts of us. We're showing the results of our faith. You can have works without faith, but you cannot have real faith without works. You know, sometimes people will pray a prayer. They say they've accepted Christ, but you see no visible results in their life. This is why when we say so many people came to faith or made a profession of faith at a crusade, we never say they were converted because only God knows if they're converted. But they prayed a prayer, they walked forward, they said they wanted to believe in Jesus. Now time will tell if that conversion is real. And if the conversion is real, it will produce results. It will produce evidence. Let me ask you a question. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? By evidence, I don't mean how many Christian bumper stickers are on your vehicle or how many Bibles you have, but evidence meaning the way you live. Can I interview your coworkers or students that you're in class with or your family members or your neighbors and say, does this person behave as a Christian? Evidence. The Bible also calls this fruit, spiritual fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering. There should be fruit in our life. So you might look at someone who says they're a Christian, but you're saying, you know, you say you're a Christian, but I don't know the way you're living. Why are you still doing drugs? Why are you still getting drunk? Why are you still partying? Why are you living with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or whatever else it is? And they'll say, hey man, don't judge me. Don't judge my journey. <sighs> Judge not lest you be judged. Okay, think of me as a fruit inspector. <laughs> I'm looking for spiritual fruit. The Bible talks about bringing forth fruit in keeping with repentance. We're all fruit inspectors. When we go to the market, we look at the fruit. Now, I don't know about you, but I like nectarines, but I like them hard. So I, I'm testing, oh, this is good, this is a good one, this would be good. I'm fruit inspecting. Okay, in the same way, people should be able to see by your fruit, by your actions, by your works, that you are a Christian. So the righteous acts of the saints, the way we're living. And that brings us to the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone will face judgment one day, Christian and non-Christian, but different kinds of judgment. For the non-believer, they will face the great white throne judgment. We'll read about that later. But we read that small and great stand before God. The books are open, and a book is open, which is the book of life. And whoever does not have their name written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. That's a judgment for the non-believer. If you end up there, there, there's no turning back. It's the final judgment. But then there is the judgment for Christians. It's different. Think of it more as an awards ceremony but we're rewarded for our faithful servants to the Lord. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, yes, in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize, so run to win. Oh wait, win? Yes, win. I wanna do the best I can do. <laughs> you need to be the best version of you. I need to be the best version of me. You're not called to live the way I'm, called to live, and by that I mean simply living out what that calling is specifically, but we're all called to glorify God. And then you'll be rewarded. You will receive the award at the judgment seat of Christ. And listen, whatever you've done in your faithfulness to God will be noted. Even the smallest gesture for God's glory will not be overlooked. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 4, that when you do whatever you do for God's glory, your Father who sees you in secret will one day reward you openly. Whatever you did, even that small gesture. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 42, if you give a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he's my disciple, 
I tell you the truth, you will certainly not lose your reward. So I'm faithful and I'm receiving these rewards from God. And now it's time for our honeymoon. The wedding is complete. Where are we going for our honeymoon? Where did you go for your honeymoon? I went to Disneyland, literally. So Kathy and I told you we had a hippie wedding. It cost like $12. And uh, someone gave us two free tickets to Disneyland and we had a really funky little hotel room not far from it. And I remember going to the Enchanted Tiki Room. You laugh, we've been married 50 years. Maybe there's something to it, I don't know. But uh, you know, it doesn't really, those things don't really matter. But the reality is we, we all had honeymoon of some kind. And now here's our honeymoon. Where are we going? Niagara Falls, Hawaii. Actually, we're coming back to the refurbished planet Earth following our bridegroom, Jesus Christ, because at the rapture, God gave us a first class round trip ticket. Let's read about it. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. He that sat in him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. We'll stop there. Look at verse 11. He's called faithful and true. God is faithful and true. This is in contrast to the devil who is not faithful and he lies. Speaking of Satan, Jesus said in John 8, 44, he's a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. There's no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language for he's a liar and he's a father of lies. So our God is faithful and true. And God keeps his promises. Whenever you see a rainbow, it's a reminder God keeps his promises. He's promised to be with us through our times of trial. He's promised to give us a peace that passes all human understanding. He's promised to give us eternal life. And he has promised to come again. Again, he says in John 14, I will come again. Heard a story about a guy that was uh, out on the road, a salesman, and he had a long day and he came back to his hotel room and he was exhausted. So he sat on the edge of his bed. He took off his first shoe and let it drop in the ground with a tremendous thud. And then it dawned on him, oh man, it's late and there's someone in a room below me. I might wake them up. So he took his other shoe up very easily and quietly and set it down. And uh, about a half hour passed and all of a sudden there's a knock at the door. Who would be knocking at my door at this hour? He opens the door and there stands a man with dark circles under his eyes. And the guy said, I'm in the room below you and will you just let the other shoe drop so I can get to sleep? You know, in many ways in our culture today, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. We see all the things going wrong, all the things unraveling. And that other shoe to drop is the return of Jesus Christ. You know, newspapers have a certain kind of type they call second coming type. They reserve this for the big events. For instance, they use second coming type when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. They use second coming type when President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. They used it again when the World Trade Center was attacked. It's interesting that it's not called mega news type or big event type. It's called second coming type. Why? Because there's no bigger event that will come to planet Earth than the second coming of Jesus Christ. And by the way, it's not just Christians that believe that. A Gallup poll was taken that revealed that 66% of Americans believe that Jesus Christ is coming back again. And listen, your reaction to this biblical teaching of the imminent return of Christ is a real spiritual barometer of where you're at with God. I think if you're right with the Lord and you have a proper relationship with him, then when you hear Jesus is coming, it's exciting. You look forward to it. You say along with the Apostle John, even so come Lord Jesus. But I think if you're not right with God, hearing that Christ could return freaks you out. So my word of encouragement to you is get right with God and be ready for the Lord's return. 
Remember when we used to play hide and seek and the person who was gonna go find you would say, ready or not, here I come. One day, Jesus will say the same thing. Here's a few things you need to know about the second coming of Jesus if you're taking notes. Number one, the second coming of Jesus will be public and it will be seen by all. It will be public and it will be seen by all. There won't be any mistaking it when it happens. You might say, well, it's not a really bad storm. and It's a second coming. You'll know it. Jesus said, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Number two, the second coming of Christ will be accompanied by sadness and weeping. It's a happy day for heaven. It's a sad day for earth. Israel will mourn as they realize that Jesus was indeed their long-awaited Messiah. Zechariah 12.10 says, they will look on him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as for an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn son who has died, and he will bring righteous retribution and vengeance. Let me contrast the rapture and the second coming one more time so you know the difference. The second coming is different from the rapture. In the rapture, he comes before judgment. In the second coming, he returns with judgment. The rapture is before the tribulation period. The second coming is at the end of the tribulation period. In the rapture, he comes for his people. In the second coming, he returns with his people. In the rapture, he comes as a thief in the night. In the second coming, every eye will see. Everyone will see. Look at verse 11. He rides a white horse. Contrast to this to what we call uh, Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. Remember when he rode the donkey into the city and the people laid palm branches down and they said, Hosanna to the son of David. The word Hosanna means save now. They didn't understand what scripture was saying. They thought he was coming as a, a military messiah to overthrow the tyranny of Rome. They didn't understand he was coming to die for the sin of the world. So they're saying, save now, do it now. But those same crowds that were saying, hail him, hail him, would soon be saying, nail him, nail him. When they cried out, crucify him, and let his blood be upon us and upon our children. The first time Christ came, he came riding a lowly donkey. When he comes again, he rides a white stallion. Interesting. In Revelation 6, uh, we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as it's sometimes called. And the first one is a white horse. The rider comes on a white horse wearing a crown. Some have thought this is about the second coming. No, it's about the imitator. Remember, anti-Christ, anti, not only means against, it means instead of. So he comes as a false Christ, but following him, comes death and war and all these horrible things. That's what Antichrist brings. So he's an imitation Christ riding a white horse. He has one crown. Jesus comes with many crowns. So here's Christ returning. This is Air Horse One. Get it? Okay, now people often wonder, what did Jesus look like? Don't you find it interesting that there's no description of the physical appearance of Jesus Christ. Not a single one. Couldn't someone have said what his height was or what color his hair was or what color his eyes were? Nothing in the Bible. But we have this interesting description of him that's largely symbolic here in Revelation 19, 12. His eyes were a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he, had name, he had a name written that no one knew except he himself. Three things stand out. The eyes, the head, and the robe. First there are his eyes. They're like a flame of fire. You know, some people, when you meet them, they refuse to make eye contact. You know people like that? And some people look straight into your eyes. It said the eyes are the window of the soul. You know, imagine what it would have been like to look into the eyes of Jesus. On one occasion, he called Matthew, the tax collector. And we read, Jesus looked at him. But it could be better translated, Jesus looked right through him. Matthew, he says, follow me, looks right through him. Matthew, whoo. 
And he follows Christ right there on the spot. There's nothing that God does not see. Hebrews 4.13 says there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Then there's his head. He wears many crowns. Why does he wear many crowns? Because he rules over all kingdoms. He's our sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing ruler. He is also our loving, compassionate, forgiving Savior. Then we have his robe, verse 13. It's clothed or dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The word dipped means spattered, spattered in blood. The first time he came, they crucified him. He shed his blood for the sin of the world. He shed his blood for you and for me. As Paul said, he loved me and gave himself for me. So he shed his blood for us. Now we come to the moment when he returns. Notice Jesus is not alone. He is followed by a large army. Verse 14, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, fight, fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Oh cool, I like white horses. Who are these armies? They're you and they're me. You say, but why? Enoch said, behold the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment in Jude 14. But who are these saints? Colossians 3, 4 gives us the answer. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. Right? You'll be there. So you're coming back with the Lord. Notice this massive army of saints and angels have no weapons. We don't need them. He does it all with the word. Verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword and with it he would strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. So now we come to the final judgment of the beast and the false prophet. Go to Revelation 19, 20. Then the beast, that's the Antichrist, was captured. With him the false prophet, that's his religious sidekick that works in cooperation with Antichrist, uh, who works signs in his presence and deceived those who received the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. They were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. I wanna add one little detail I forgot. Look at verse 19. As I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So before I tell you what happens to the Antichrist and the false prophet, look at what they're doing. Here's Christ returning in all of his glory. King of kings, Lord of lords. And what do they do? Verse 19, they make war against him. This just reminds us of that simple truth. Sin makes you stupid. And when you live in a pattern and a lifestyle of sin, your heart will become irreparably hardened and you can go beyond the point of no return. Did you know there's a point of no return? Are you saying there's a point where God would no longer forgive me? What I'm really saying is, is there will come a point where you no longer want to be forgiven. It is why the Bible says, harden not your heart if you can hear his voice. So here's the Lord himself returning in glory. Antichrist is trying to stop him. How ridiculous that is. Now they face their final judgment. They're immediately judged. They're so wicked, they're sent directly to the lake of fire. They go straight to hell. And by the way, they're the first to arrive there. Hmm. What a dubious distinction. First in hell, here you go. Hell was not made for people. Jesus said hell was made for the devil and his angels. As wicked as they were, the Lord takes no pleasure in this, but justice needs to be given out. Now they face this judgment, and John is taking this all in. Now remember what's happening. How did this all come about, this book of Revelation? So John the apostle, according to church tradition, was arrested for preaching the gospel. He's an old man now. And tradition tells us they put him in a pot of boiling oil, but he wouldn't cook. They said, let's just banish this guy. We'll banish him to the island of Patmos. We'll never hear from him again. Uh-huh. And while he's there banished on that distant island, Jesus himself comes to John and effectively puts him in what we might describe as a spiritual time machine and catapults him into the future and he sees all the things that we're reading about. So here is John taking it in. The angel is revealing it to him and John is so amazed. Verse 10, 
I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said, don't do that. I'm your fellow servant and of your brothers who have the testimony of Jesus. Listen, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What is the point of prophecy? To dazzle us, to entertain us, to educate us? Not really. The real purpose of prophecy, that is the study of end times events, is to reveal Jesus to us. Remember I pointed out revelation means the unveiling. Yes, it's the unveiling of the future. Yes, it's the unveiling of these mysterious figures, Antichrist, false prophet, all the rest of it. But really, ultimately, it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And as I talk about this topic, if it doesn't cause me to grow in my love for the Lord, I've effectively missed the point. <laughs> this is the bottom line of life. It's to know and to see and to love Jesus Christ. Let me close with this. Judgment is coming to every person. If you're a Christian, you'll stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Don't panic. That's when rewards are given out. But live a faithful and godly life so some rewards will be given to you. But if you're a non-believer, you'll stand at the great white throne judgment. And there's no second chance after that. That's why you want to decide now what you're going to do. You decide in this life where you will spend the afterlife. Hi, I'm Greg Laurie. I've got some good news for you. God loves you and God has a plan for your life. Here's the problem. We're separated from God by our sin because we've all broken His commandments. But the good news is, is 2,000 years ago, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sin and then to rise again from the dead. The same Jesus who died and rose is alive and ready to come into your life right now. Would you like your sin forgiven? Would you like to know that when you die, you will go to heaven? If so, pray this simple prayer with me right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin. I turn from my sin now, and I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Did you just pray that prayer with me? If you did, God in heaven has heard you. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God.